I want to take a minute to respond to an article um, that was put out this morning uh, by the Trucker newspaper. It's talking about the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration and the new hours of service. Now, let me give you a quick recap. When I started driving in 1997, uh, we could drive 10 hours with an 8-hour break. And that was pretty much it. Drive 10, sleep 8, drive 10, sleep 8. In uh, 2002 or 2003, they changed it to where we get 14 hours of total on-duty time we're allowed to have. And within that 14 hours, we can drive 11 hours. Uh, what it did was, you know, if I start at 6 a.m., I go on duty for the first time, uh, then 6 a.m. plus 14 hours is 8 p.m., which means regardless if I drive 5 miles or 500, at 8 p.m. at that 14th hour, I'm done. I have to shut down and take a break, which was increased to 10 hours. Nothing about this business is standard. You know, this is not a 9 to 5 job. You know, it, everything changes from minute to minute, and at any given time, um, you, you've got to turn on a dime and go a different direction. So what the 14-hour rule did was, you know, it kept carriers and companies from, uh, you know, after a driver's been sitting and waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting, and then, um, oh, here's the load, you know, take off uh, and run all night to get there, even though you've been up for, you know, 12 or 13 hours, You've been sitting there for eight, so you've got a fresh 10 and you're ready to go. So I think the 14-hour rule was a big help. And, that's, and it's important to be noted, the 14-hour rule had already been self-imposed by some carriers before the federal government came in and decided to impose the mandate. Uh, one carrier that I worked for, uh, they, had, they had already put a 14-hour rule in and uh, the Qualcomm system would track you, and at the 14th hour, you had to shut down. Um, so the free market uh, had already come up with this idea before the government came in and waved their magic finger. What is that debate now is um, you have these, these lobbying groups. Uh, one is called Public Citizen. One is called Crash, Citizens for Reliable and Safe Highways. And there's another one, I'm not sure if they're, they're uh, mentioned in this one, but it's uh, Mothers Against Tired Truckers. I am not a fan of these lobbying groups. Um, I see them as a parasite, and I see them as people who exploit the uh, tragedy and pain of people uh, whose family members have been involved in car truck accidents. Um, I don't believe that the people that run these organizations are interested in uh, the public good. Uh, they are interested in power, and that's, that's all they're for. So I have absolutely no use or respect for any of these groups. I'm also not a big fan of the American Trucking Association. Um, they're just another big money lobbying group um, that gets in cahoots with the Truckload Carriers Association, um, and, you know, they they go on and on and, and have these great political statements about how they're, you know, here to take care of drivers and owner operators, but it just doesn't happen. I'm sorry. Now, that's my individual opinion, and I'll stand by it. Okay, so what we're dealing with now is they come out and they want to adjust the rules, and they want to keep the 11-hour rule and the 14-hour rule in place, but they want to add a 30-minute break, and they also want to change the 34-hour restart rule. And that was added when the, the new hours came in, in 02 or 03, which basically said, when you sit for 34 hours, your hours restarts. We get 70 hours in 8 days, which means... Um, that uh, you know, it's it's rolling. You know, you 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 drop hours and you pick up hours. And so, when the um, when the thirty four hour restart came, you know, like if I go home for a weekend and I'm off and out of the truck for thirty four hours, well, at that point my hours reset and I get my seventy back. They want to change the thirty four hour restart rule to say that it has to include two periods of 1 a.m. to 5 a.m. This is the most ridiculous rule 
it, 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 it has no common sense whatsoever. This business is not 9 to 5, okay? You've got to understand that. I, I've had jobs where I got up at 1 every day, and I worked until 3 p.m. That was my schedule, six days a week. With this rule, doing that job, I would have not been eligible for a restart because I worked a different kind of shift. You cannot turn the trucking industry into an 8 to 5 or 9 to 5 job because it just doesn't happen. This world doesn't operate that way. The most laughable, laughable part of this article is, uh, quote, as the agency's cost-benefit analysis shows, the benefits of the limitation in terms of crash reduction and health effects more than outweigh their pro productivity costs. The cost-benefit analysis is based on appropriate data and scientifically sound methodologies despite petitioners' claims to the contrary. The contention of ATA, American Trucking Association, petitioners that an unlimited restart is the only rational decision FMCSA could have made here is therefore incorrect. Okay, let me tell you what's incorrect. I've been in this business for 15 years. I've driven over 1 million miles sitting behind the wheel of a truck. I have forgotten more about the trucking industry than these clowns will ever know. Cost-benefit analysis shows. Blah, blah, blah. Uh, FMCSA's exercise of its expertise and discretion here was appropriate and reasonable and therefore the petitions for review should be denied. Appropriate and reasonable. Now the the uh, the lobbying groups want the hours of service dropped from 11 to 10. Okay, you can do all your cost-benefit analysis and your scientific BS all you want to. Here's reality. On the rare occasion, and it's rare, that I actually drive to the limit of my hours. I did uh, all the other day, what was it? Uh, Sunday, because I was home. I got a 34-hour restart. I was home for 36, 37 hours. And then I got in the truck after being home with my wife and children for 36 hours. I got up at 6 a.m. And I drove until about, oh, so no, that's wrong. I, did, I got up about and left about 7 a.m. And I drove with a couple of breaks along the way. I took a 30-minute break because I had to eat. Um, and I got done at 6.30. I had 15 minutes left on my hours of service for driving, which means I drove 10 hours and 45 minutes that day. At the end of that day, yeah, I was tired, okay? I, I'm not going to debate that. I was tired, and I was ready to go to bed. But it's just so rare that we drive that way every single day because here's my weapon of mass destruction uh, or instruction. Here's my weapon of mass instruction. Okay, an average truck can do 60 miles an hour while driving, okay? Which means if I drove to the full limit, that's 660 miles a day, okay? And if I did that 660 miles... Uh, 11, I could do 6.36 plus 660. That would be 4,200 miles in a week. I've done that once in the last 21 months. One time. You're making assumptions based on things that don't happen. And then you get to come out and declare, look, we've made things safer. Well, here's a news flash for you. Since 1979... The trucking industry has gotten safer by way of it reduced crashes of 4.7% a year. 1979, 4.7 a year, or 4.8. Okay? 1979 to now. Okay? The geniuses at the FMCSA come out with CSA 2010. Uh, their new program that that where they wave their magic wand and fix everything, they come out after the first year and say, "Look, truck crashes reduced by four point seven percent. It's working. No, it's been going down four point eight percent since nineteen seventy friggin nine. You idiots! 
You don't have a clue what the hell you're talking about. But yet they get these groups, public citizen, and they, you know, they show crashes and, and oh, here's data and here's this. Well, he, he think about this, okay? This is the only way I can think I would explain it. When I started driving a truck in 1997, and I would go to get fuel, okay? Stay with me. I would go to get fuel at a truck stop. The truck would hold a couple hundred gallons of fuel, okay? And I would pull up to the fuel island, and I would have to get out of my truck, walk inside the truck stop, slide my card with the person, the attendant inside, walk back out to my truck, fuel, get done fueling, where it would take about 10 minutes or so to, to get the 200 gallons. Then I would get back in my truck, pull forward out of the space to make room for the truck behind me, walk back inside, wait in line, sign my ticket, walk back out to my truck and leave. Okay? Now, since 1997, I will propose that the number of truck stops has doubled, if not tripled. Meaning, the availability of places for us to stop and get fuel has grown exponentially since 1997. And also, with the advent of technology, I don't even have to go inside anymore. I pull up to the fuel island, I get out, I swipe my card, I dump my 200 gallons of fuel, I shove it in gear and haul ass. There are times that from the time I hit the exit ramp to pull into a truck stop, get fuel, get back on the road in less than 12 minutes when I'm in a hurry. Okay? Now, there's still a matter of congestion at truck stops. Well, how is it that with triple the truck stops, the truck stops are just as much or more congested than they were in 1997? Well, here's a clue. Because the number of trucks has doubled exponentially. All that commerce online, all the Amazon.com and all the eBay and all that shipping, 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 that's me. Okay? That's me and every other guy out here like me. FedEx and UPS and the, and the, and the Postal Service, all that crap comes on a truck. Okay? You don't get your iPhone 5 without it having been on a truck. It comes on a ship from China in a container. Then the container either hits the railroad or it hits a truck or both, and then it has made its way through the chain of distribution to your Verizon store, your AT&T store, your Best Buy, and your Apple store. Okay, it all comes on trucks. This is not rocket science. This industry has gotten safer and safer and safer and safer all by itself. Do we have problems? You betcha. Do we have knuckleheads running up and down the road causing problems? You betcha. And guess what? Your safety inside your car is your responsibility. I tell my wife this all the time. As I'm out here on the road and I see the knuckle-dragging morons running up and down the highway in cars and trucks, and I see them driving like fools and driving over their head and running out of talent, and then they crash and then say, Oh, what happened? I don't know. I tell my wife... Who, who carries my precious three- and six-year-old children, you are responsible for your safety. You have got to leave yourself an out. You have got to pay attention because you're the only person that can truly keep yourself safe from the moron running down the road with his text message and on Facebook. You're the only one that can do it. The government cannot wave its magic wand and make crashes go away because you have people... Human beings sitting on 40 tons of engine and steel, and guess what? They're going to screw up. They're going to make mistakes. And then people get hurt. So this government is going to continue. They're going to make their rules and their provisions, and they're going to study, and they're going to waste. And, and, and at the end of the day, guys like me, safe drivers. I am a safe driver. There's probably times in my career that I wasn't a safe driver because I was a dumbass kid running up down the road 90 mile an hour with my hair on fire. You know, because I was Billy Big Rigger, concrete cowboy. But then I grew up and I realized that I have responsibilities. And the more responsibilities a driver has, the safer he is, which is why you will see companies that are 100% owner operator where the driver's neck is on the line where if he wrecks his truck, it doesn't make any money, and if he doesn't make any money, his children and his, and his family goes hungry because he's not making any money, that's when you understand that safety is a bigger priority. 
So can we just stop with the madness here? Please, I beg you. This stuff is not going to do anything except make this business impossible to work in. My wife just told me on the phone last night. She said, well, do all you can do for two years. Uh, run as hard as you can and make as much money as you can because the more the federal government gets involved and you, you wait, watch, the, the, the TSA is going to hit the trucking industry. And when they do, I'm done. I'm out. I'm not putting up with these idiots that y'all hired at the airports to make the airplanes safe. I'm not doing it. I'll go do something else. I'll go down build a restaurant somewhere. Of course, you probably can't do that because the, the food police is going to show up and, you know, scared to death you're going to give somebody a trans fat. Oh, my God! Please, give me a break. I, you know, the government's not the problem. It's you people that sit around and beg for them to fix everything. You want to fix something? Get off your ass and go fix it. If not, mind your own business.